Um, well, I, I will start for, um, with the fact that I'm from Buffalo, New York, um, and that's where I am tonight. And it's a place that's seen some really rough years because of the divestment that Rakeen and Lindsay um, were just talking about and where in response, you know, the white Christian nationalist right really has grown in strength um, over, over the course of my life. Um, you know, we had the first member of Congress to endorse Trump, the second highest number of people that were there on the Capitol on January 6th. And of course, Buffalo was in the news a couple of years ago because of the white nationalist massacre that happened at Topps uh, Supermarket, which you know led to the murder of 10, 10 black folks just a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, I, I grew up in a split household um, where I had union members on one side and militia members on the other. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in my house knowing that we had the things we had in our lives because my dad was part of the union and that he was part of struggle with other people to get the things that we needed in our lives. Um, and a couple of years ago, I went to a family reunion in, in upstate New York and realized that a number of my family members um, were wearing three percenter militia gear, which of course are one of the nationalist, white nationalist militias that popped up after Obama was elected and certainly been part of the growing white nationalist movement. So I think, you know, part of what we're seeing at Surge, you know, my family is an example of how people are, are not kind of born formed, but really can go one way or the other based on who is organizing them and who is helping them make sense of so much of the devastation and heartbreak and suffering that people are experiencing in the world right now um, that we've already begun to touch, touch in on tonight. Um, and, you know, I think in the absence of a political home or a union, you know, for many people in my family, um, we, we've seen the ways in which the, the right wing is recruiting them in every aspect of their lives online, at shooting clubs, at church, you know, folks are being pulled towards more authoritarian movements to try to make sense of the world and, and have, you know, connection and belonging. Um, and, you know, while the core of Trump's base is not working people, like the guys on January 6th were not poor people, right? They, they got there and they had a lot of gear with them. Um, across the country, we are seeing authoritarian forces working to make gains among working and poor people um, in this community, uh, you know, across the country. And part of the way that we make sense of that at Surge and, you know, with many other people in the movement is that you know, that just that this did not happen overnight, right? That this was, this has been part of a strategy. There's like many dynamics at play, which I'm sure Scott and Jose will talk more about, but two of them that we think are really important is, you know, the attack by corporate forces on the labor movement and on organized labor, which was, you know, a, a large political working class institution that was, you know, imperfect as the labor movement is, organized labor. Um, it was an institution that brought people together and still does bring together people, working people across lines of difference um, and did build multiracial working class solidarity. And then, of course, you know, after uh, in the aftermath of passing the Voting Rights Act in 64, um, there was, uh, you know, the GOP and other corporate forces came together to advance the Southern strategy, which, of course, was a strategy and a way to build a path to governing power. Um, that was really rooted in stoking racism. That was, that was how they thought they'd build a path to power and they certainly had succeeded. <laughs> so those two dynamics um, have led to some really um, challenging organizing terrain for many of us to be out there, but it's part of what's gotta be done in this moment. Um, and so that's some of the work that Surge is up to. You know, we see ourselves as part of a, the big multiracial movement that we need to fight back against, you know, the forces that we're up against. and. You know, while we know that our opposition is recruiting people of all races and genders, you know, the elephant in the room often is that the, the biggest part of our opposition's base is overwhelmingly white. Um, and we know the ways in which the right has used racism to separate white communities and make sure that our communities, for those of us who are white, remain, you know, silent on the sidelines or even antagonistic to movements for justice or pro-democracy movements that are really fighting for a better world for all of us. And so we do work in communities where we know our opposition and authoritarian forces are strong um, to try to move people off the sidelines and into solidarity. Um, so maybe I'll share just two quick stories about what, what we've been up to. Um, you know, we've been on the ground uh, most recently. I'll tell a story about Tennessee and, and North Carolina. We've been doing work in, in Tennessee for quite a few years at this point. Um, and our work in the state really um, kicked off after um, there were a number of rallies that were being planned by the Klan in Tennessee um, in the aftermath of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. And um, 
they were they planned a number of rallies in rural parts of the state and we had a number of people who lived in those places reach out to us who had been connected to Serge's work and say you know we don't want to let these folks run through our town um, and so we supported people to begin knocking doors and talking to their neighbors about what it meant that uh, what what they thought about the fact that the Klan was there in their communities knocking doors and dropping lit and we also talked to people about the suffering that they were experiencing what were the struggles that were that were in their lives as well and we had hundreds and hundreds of conversations in small towns in Tennessee. And we found that the, the issue that was impacting people most deeply was um, housing. People didn't have a safe or affordable place to live. And so we began bringing people together to be able to fight back against that. I'm sure in campaigns, like many people on this call have been part of. And so we did things like putting pressure on city council. We worked with faith communities to keep people in their homes. We made sure people had food and the things they needed to be able to hang together. Um, and we built a lot of strong relationships and a home, I think, that was really giving people purpose and belonging and helping people understand that they needed each other and we needed each other to be able to get the things we needed in our lives. That process also helped really make very clear for folks who their true enemies were, right? And it was certainly not the immigrant folks in their community who they lived down the street with or sometimes right next door to. Um, it became very, very clear to folks who the, who the true enemies were. It was people in the state legislature that were blocking them from passing legislation at the local level that would improve people's lives. It was some of the white nationalist groups that were very closely embedded with some of the landlords um, who were profiting off of people being not able to keep their families safe. Um, and so through that process, um, you know, a lot of people have found a different kind of political home. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, we were able to elect one of our members to city council on an anti-clan, pro-renter, pro-working class agenda. This is in a town that Trump won by 70 percentage points. So I think this is a really powerful example that it is possible to organize in places where folks um, are really suffering. And when we are able to give people a sense of connection, belonging and agency, um, that folks are way less vulnerable to some of the advances that the authoritarian forces are trying to, to make in our communities. Second quick story I'll tell, um, you know, is that we're, we're, off, we're also, um, we've been on the ground in North Carolina, of course, where the hurricane just came through and devastated and we're facing, a, you know, in some ways a different, in some ways very similar challenge. Um, you know, we know that in the wake of many of these disasters, we see a really ruthless strategy unfold and we see two sets of forces, both of whom are our enemies, the far right and corporate power really use moments like this to advance their agendas, right? Like they advance disaster capitalism, right? We see corporations swoop in and try to seize profits and privatize things like water, education, healthcare, the few public things we have left in this country, we see in these moments, corporate forces try to privatize um, and create less, um, less public goods. The other thing we're seeing on the ground too is that we see the ways in which the far right use moments, move, moments like this to be able to gross their forces too. And we've seen over and over again, and folks may have seen this is also happening in North Carolina, there are right-wing militia groups that will show up in the aftermath of these storms and provide housing and water and clothing to people, right? To advance the story that the government doesn't care about them um, and that they're caring instead for black and brown people, right? And we know that that can be an on-ramp into the world of, of white nationalism. And so, you know, at Surge, part of what we're up to is also trying to intervene in these dynamics and, and provide for people, um, take care of people in very material ways. Um, and help, again, bring people into a, a posture of solidarity, right? Um, and so right now in Western North Carolina, we're out there knocking doors. We are trying to make sure that people are connected and have the things they need. Um, and it's been challenging. You know, there's not working phones and not a lot of open roads. Um, but we're, what we're you know, trying to show up, caring for people, trying to build that sense of belonging, meeting people's needs, um, and with the hope and real belief that people will stick with us um, over, over time. So, I mean, I think I'll just say maybe in conclusion, I think part of what we're seeing on the ground is that, you know, the far right and authoritarian movements can really thrive when they have no competition, when there's no one else in, in so many of these communities. And so part of what I think our ta the task is for us is for us to really um, expand organizing in communities that have, you know, less organizing infrastructure and to really be with people, both in meeting their needs and fighting for a different world um, where all of us can get our needs met. Um, so yeah, that's some of how we're seeing this play out on the ground.